All right, looks like the stream is going. Really an experience with streaming, but it's showing that it's live, so we'll see what happens. So I'm going to start off with Star Trek and turn on Keycaster. Okay, casting the keys, clean up the terminal a bit. Are you okay? Hello there. Already a viewer has tuned in. That's interesting. So I set up my directory here in my lab repo, uh, lab Kubernetes CKS. So you can find that on my GitHub too. Currently just contains a readme file. But I'm actually going to write a little file here, which I'll call stream.md. Because... Um, I plan to show this file for a little bit before I start streaming every time because I'll be talking for a little bit now, but I'm basically planning on just uh, streaming what I do and not necessarily being very interactive or talking a lot, just showing you my process of taking notes, how I implement the Zettelkasten method. And if I feel like it, I will, I will talk. Uh, and if I don't, I won't. So I should write a bit of a note that captures that, that I can show for the first minute of the stream so people know what to expect. Um, the stream is not necessarily very interactive. Um, I need to focus on actually studying which means I cannot um, respond to the chat constantly. Um, I will talk when I feel like it, it and when it will uh, aid the understanding of the material. Um, idea is to, intention is to show you my studying process and how I use the Zellkasten method and my second brain system for studying and productivity. Let's see, the stream is not necessarily very interactive. I need to focus on actually studying, which means I cannot respond to the chat constantly. Intention is to show my studying process and how I use the cell cast method and my second brain system for studying and productivity. I'll talk when I feel like it and when it will aid the understanding of the material, but actually studying and focusing is the main priority. Okay, I think that's all I want to establish before I get going. Um, I haven't done any study streams before ever, so this is totally new. I have had the intention though, and one of the reasons I haven't done it yet is because courses are usually private, right? So I'm on a Cloud Guru or 
Udemy, you can't just start streaming that because then you you are infringing on copyright. But the creator of Killer is H, uh, he actually has a course on Udemy on the CKS, and he released it on YouTube. So this course I can actually just do live. So I thought it would be interesting to to you know, go through the course, write the notes, and do the work and show you how I do it. And yeah, maybe it's interesting, maybe it's not. If anything, it will be fun to document the journey on my channel. I've had the CKS course for a long time as a goal. Uh, like over six months, I've had this as a goal. And now the, the moment is finally here. I feel like this is the right time to start because I might have some extra time during the coming weeks. And um, I'm just going to go for it. So I, I did start the course uh, here and there. I watched the first hour, which is just basically introduction to Kubernetes. It wasn't that interesting, but good to refresh things. And now I came to a point where um, we're going to containers under the hood, going into kernel space and user space. And that's when I figured, okay, this is actually where I'm going to start taking some notes. And that's when I figured, okay, this is the time to start um, start your stream, if that's what I want to want to do. So all of the housekeeping and setup out of the way, I'm going to start my POMO timer for 50 minutes and I'm going to get going. Containers under the hood. With this section, you will get to know containers much better and in much more detail because from a Kubernetes security perspective, it is important to understand what containers are, how they work and how they interact with our operating systems. And for this, we will start with containers and images. We then have a look into namespaces and C groups, the kind of building blocks for containers. And we also have a look into some hands-on scenarios, which should make these things more clear to us. So container and image. What is a container? What is an image? Let's start with a Docker file to explain this, okay? So we now explain this on the example of Docker containers because they're the most prevalent out there. Docker file is means we can run Docker build and Docker build will build our image. Then we have our image and the image could be described as a multi-layer binary representation of state which we described in our docker file from that image we can then create a container so using docker run we actually create a container and we could say that a container is a running instance of an image and there can be multiple running instances of an image so there can be multiple containers of the same image also very common, once we build our image, we actually push it into a container repository and then whenever we would like to run it, we can actually docker pull that image and then docker run this image. So that's as the simple difference between docker file, container image and the actual container. So what is a container? Down here we see docker or connection of one or include all to run a process which runs on the Linux kernel with some restrictions because it cannot see everything. It is kind of 
at the broad architecture. And to understand this, let's have a look at the broad architecture. On the bottom, we have the hardware. And on top of the hardware sits the Linux kernel. And the Linux kernel actually provides a so-called syscall interface. These syscalls or system calls like getpid or reboot will then be provided to libraries like glibc or applications like Firefox libraries like PID or reboot will then be provided to libraries like glibc or applications like Firefox or Curl. And in this scenario, this doesn't play a big difference if these applications run directly on the Linux kernel or containerized in a Docker container, which we will see soon. So in the end, we have down here the kernel space, which includes the Linux kernel and the syscall interface. And then up here, we have the user space where our libraries and applications run. And the syscall interface is then the possibility to communicate with the Linux kernel, right? And our application the possibility to communicate with the Linux kernel, right? And and our applications can call the syscall interface directly, or our applications can go through libraries, which is often the case, and then these libraries communicate with our syscall interface of the Linux kernel. So the syscall interface can kind of be seen as an API from the Linux kernel to allow for communication with it. And then when we do some syscalls, then these will be reached down to the Linux kernel and the Linux kernel communicates with the hardware. So we have to be well, we have to understand that our application like Firefox even if it's containerized like here, can perform direct syscalls to the syscall interface. Let's have a look at this in another view. We have the hardware on the bottom again. Here in yellow, we have the Linux kernel. And let's say we have an app one process, could be our Firefox process. It's the app one process and it is containerized. It runs as a Docker container, but this means that that process can still perform system calls against the host Linux kernel. And the very same thing could do another process, let's call it app2 process, which is running in a completely different Docker container. And that app2 process could also perform syscalls to the very same Linux kernel. So this is something important to understand that if we schedule many containers on one operating system, like we do in Kubernetes, we have a worker node, and depending on how many free resources there are, we can schedule 10, 20, 100 pods with various containers on that node, which means they all run on the same Linux kernel and they can all perform system calls to the same Linux kernel.
and down here again we have the kernel space and here we have the user space for our applications So this means, yes, we can have one container which is wrapped in a kernel group and we'll have a look at these kernel groups. We now simply call them kernel groups. We'll have a look at these soon. So we have our app one process, we have our app two process, we have our app three process. And the thing from the security perspective is that if these all run on the same Linux kernel and if these all can perform syscalls to the Linux kernel, then these all could also exploit some Linux kernel bugs and there have been some in the future and there probably are some right now which means that it could be that there's not a too strong isolation between for example the app1 process and the app2 process if there is an exploit or some exploitable security issue in the kernel but we will explore this as well further in the CKS training course this is right now only as an overview of how containers work and how they run and how they interact with the operating system. So what's the difference then between a container and a virtual machine? So if we have a virtual machine, then it has an operating system and a kernel. And on top of this, we actually simulate another operating system with another kernel, which means our application process, app process actually runs on a different kernel and not on the host operating system kernel down here. If we have a look at containers on the left, then it's a bit different. We have our operating system, we have our host kernel, and our application process could directly run on that kernel, or we wrap that application process in a kernel group, we kind of containerize it, we put it in a container, but it means that application process still runs on the same kernel, which means here on the left, that kernel can actually directly access the app process whereas here on the right that host kernel down here cannot access the app process at least directly it has to go through like a arbitrary binary layer of the simulated operating system so that's as a simple difference between containers and virtual machines and now let's have a look at linux kernel namespaces namespaces isolate processes and this is necessary because we want to create containers containers are simply processes on the same linux kernel but we want to isolate them so we put them in namespaces there is for example the pid namespace and the pid namespace isolates processes from each other one process cannot see others and for example process id 10 can exist multiple times once in every namespace there's the mount namespace which restricts access to mounts or root file system there's the network namespace which only allows access to certain network devices firewall routing rules socket port numbers so not able to see all traffic or contact all endpoints so network isolation and there's the user namespace which means a different set of user ids is used and for example, user zero root inside one namespace can be different from user zero inside another namespace. And this also means that the host root user zero is different than the user zero inside a container because of namespaces. So if we talk about container isolation and how 
containers and Docker containers are built. Then we have the namespaces to restrict what processes can see. And by this, we kind of simulate an isolation layer between these and we kind of create the containers with this. And this can, for example, be restrict other processes, users or file system access. And then there are also C groups and the C groups restrict the resource usage of processes. And this can, for example, be restricting the RAM, memory usage, disk usage or CPU usage. And using these namespaces and these C groups, we can create isolation, container isolation, and we can actually create containers. In this session, we will have a look in these C groups, we can create wrapped if you look at our bug. So what's we simulate another operating system with have the namespaces to restrict what processes can see. And by this we kind of simulate an isolation layer between these and we kind of create the containers with this. And this can for example be restrict other processes, users or file system access. And then there are also C groups and the C groups restrict names inside these is like a, so that's as a simple difference and now let's have a look at linux kernel namespaces namespaces isolate processes and this is necessary because we want to create containers containers are simply processes on the same linux kernel but we want to isolate them so we put them in namespaces there is for example the pid namespace and the PID namespace isolates processes from each other. One process cannot see others. And for example, process ID 10 can exist multiple times, once in every namespace. There's the mount namespace, which restricts access to mounts or root file system. Mount namespace, which restricts access to mounts or root file system. There's the network namespace, which only allows access to certain network devices, firewall, routing rules, socket port numbers.
So not able to see all traffic or contact all endpoints, so network isolation. And there's the user namespace, which means a different set of user IDs is used. And for example, user zero root inside one namespace can be different from user zero inside another namespace. And this also means that the host root user user zero is different than the user zero inside a container because of namespaces. So if we talk about container isolation and how containers and Docker containers are built, then we have the namespaces to restrict what processes can see. And by this, we kind of simulate an isolation layer between these and we kind of create the containers with this. And this can, for example, be restrict other processes, users, or file system access. And then there are also C groups, and these C groups restrict the resource usage of processes. And this can, for example, be restricting the RAM, memory usage, disk usage, or CPU usage. And using these namespaces and these C groups, we can create isolation, container isolation, and we can actually create containers. In this session, we will have a look at container tools and the tools are Docker, Containerd, GreaseCTL, Portman and we will actually build a very simple container using these tools. So to have a short overlook, what is Docker? Docker, Containerd, Container Runtime, especially not anymore, or CRI compatible container runtimes, as the universe with Docker and then Portman as a container and Portman as our managing tool. So, and what we do is we start from bash. So this means there is already an existing image, in this case, a Docker image, bash, and we inherit everything from bash. And what we do with this is we simply run one comment ping with the argument killer.sh. Two lines, this is our Docker file, really simple, really small, really straightforward. We save this. So here we have our Docker file. So a Docker file is a text, an image. And Docker builds all images. I grab for six, eight, and Docker. Yeah, that's all Docker can do. Because 
same as Podman. And we now run replace spin designs the name Docker with Podman. So this means we can also say Podman image ls, and there we now I Docker with Podman. Now let's also talk about Cree CTL. So let's let's bring Docker. Okay, it's there since Kubernetes version 1.22, we use container D. So what we can do here is we run Cree CTL ps, and here we see our container. And if we have a look at the config of Cree CTL, then we actually see it's configured to communicate with the container D runtime. So in this config, it could also be that it's configured to talk to Docker or to another runtime. So in this case, what we see right here is we use Cree CTL to communicate with container D. Okay. So I think this should give you a nice introduction into the diff we can use. In this hands-on session, we will now actually see Docker container isolation in action. We will create two containers and check that their processes cannot see each other. And we will then run them in the very same PID namespace and see what happens. So it's a hands-on session, follow me along, do the same thing on your master node. We won't interact with Kubernetes right now. We will simply run Docker containers for this. We can run a Docker container, Docker run. We give it a name. First one is C1. We would like to run Ubuntu and we would like to run it uh, detached. Let's do it like this in detached mode Ubuntu. And we execute SH and say, this simply sleeps one day. Okay, we just create a Ubuntu container which sleeps one day and runs in the background. We see here the ID. We could now use the ID, but because we gave it a name, we can also use that name. So we can simply do docker exec c1 ps, and then we see, okay, a few processes in that container, very clean. And here we actually have our sleep container running, our sleep process running in that container. Let's do the same for a container named C2. And instead of sleeping one day, we say we sleep 999 days. There we go, container created. And if we now exec into that container, then we also see three processes, but we see they're different. Here we have that sleep one with 999 days, and here we actually have that sleep one with one day. So this means these processes run on the same Linux kernel, but these are isolated from each other because Docker automatically wraps these processes in namespaces. And if we now actually have a look, if we now wrap for processes called sleep on our host Linux system, then we actually see we see both processes, right? We see the sleep one day and we see the sleep 999 days. Why? Because the container processes simply run on the same Linux kernel. Now let's actually delete the second container. So we can simply do docker rm c2 and force. Our c2 container is gone. And we recreate the container again, but with an addition. We can actually define the PID namespace. So the reason I'm not seeing this on my macOS system is because I'm using Rancher desktop. Um, to run docker so let's see if we can actually enter the enter rancher desktop if we can actually connect to the vm <laughs> can i actually enter that vm uh, rancher desktop. These are the containers I'm running, so you can see them here. But can I actually enter this VM somehow? Virtual machine. Hardware volumes. The 
one thing I can just enter that you can see the processes on here I don't really want to get into a Linux VM right now I just wanted to see this yeah I I mean I intended to follow on, follow along with all the hands-on stuff, but I I do fully understand what's going on here. So, I I think I'm okay with this. Let's just continue. And we set it to the namespace of an existing container called C1. Okay, so we create the container C2, and with this little addition, we now say this container will run in the very same PID namespaces na namespace as container one. Let's run it, there we go. And let's have a look. Let's exec into container C2, look for processes, and yes, there we actually see our own processes and the ones from the other container. And if we now have a look at container run, we run the same command for container one, then we actually see both containers are now in the same PID namespace and can see their same processes because of this. And this section gave us a nice little overview about what containers are. And there's a very great talk by Liz Rice, what have namespaces done for you lately, where she actually shows in a bit more detail and also practical how containers are created and what containers actually are. I currently work for a company called Aqua Security. In this section, we talked about containers in general. We made a comparison towards virtual machines. We talked about Linux kernel namespaces and C groups in the Linux kernel. And we actually saw these in action by creating Docker containers. Okay, and getting into some killer coda scenarios. Let's see, killer coda. Um, CKS certification. So what is the Probably this one then, container namespaces. From the scenario list, see video description. Or killers H CKS course environment. Uh, I think I had that open the other day. environment scenarios yeah container namespaces docker namespaces podman okay let's check it out container namespaces docker well i had a big mouth and said that i understood what was going on so now we're going to see if i actually do How much do they charge for the plus membership? 10 bucks a month. Use scenarios for up to four hours. Prove your min. Okay, I might have actually go for that membership for this uh, study for a month, because this is gonna be really annoying to Wait for these queues constantly. Mm -hmm. 
that at any point in time you can reset your cluster anytime you like you can delete your instances recreate them and create your cluster again because every new section in this course works with a fresh cluster this doesn't mean that you have to work with a fresh cluster when the because every new Networks. Network policies, okay. That is the one that I have. Um, that's going to be the next section. And network policies are definitely my one of my weaknesses. And I have set up a new set of daily routines for myself where I'm going to be doing RBAC scenarios and also network policy scenarios every day just to get the, um, get it into my fingers. Ah, here we go. Container namespaces, Docker. Solve in the remote desktop environment. Okay. Yes, let's start. Run two Docker containers. App one, app two with the following attributes. So I should run image nginx alpine. Should share the same PID kernel namespace. And check which container sees which processes and makes sense of why. Okay. So I should run share the same PID kernel namespace. Well, that was exactly what he was doing here. C2. So first we will do Docker. It's the one that I was using here. Oops. Her name, app one, image is Alpine, and it was SHC. Run command sleep infinity. And I should run in the background. That's what I do here with the dash D. And they should share the same PID kernel namespace. So app one can just run like this. Okay, docker ps that's running so now the second one is going to be app 2 and then we're going to use the what was the command pid is container PID is container app one. Mm -hmm. Then Docker exec app one. Yes, aux. Oh, that's annoying. Sleep infinity, sleep infinity. So the in the Docker, the app one container is now seeing both of them. And the app two container can also see both of them. So there it is mutual. 
it is mutual. I think I've solved it. I, they can see both sleep infinity. Yeah, I think I've solved it. Let's check it. Congratulations, you solved the challenge. Okay, nice. Then we're going back to the scenarios. And the next one was on Podman. So that was pretty easy. But then I'm going to save that command. That's actually quite a useful thing app one P, and then it was image alpine sleep infinity oh this one loaded a lot quicker okay so i can just go straight forward run two podman containers app one yeah, so it's basically the same, but here we're not using Docker, but we're using CRI CTL probably. Uh, which Docker, which, which CRI CTL, Podman. Okay, so this is Podman running here. Ah, okay. I see. So this this was just Docker run, and then now he wants me to do it in Podman, and that's interesting. I have actually, I haven't been using Podman at all. So run two Podman containers at one. So let's just check it out if it is exactly the same or not. Docker run. Oops, uh, Podman run. Podman run. Just, just trying if it is actually the same command. Podman run name app one. Yeah. Why did it come as image alpine? It should be nginx alpine. Okay, so Podman PS, does that work? Yeah, that's just the same. Okay. Uh, set dash OVI. Podman run. App 2. PID is container app 1. I think that was it. Is it that easy? It's just, just mutually compatible. Podman exec app two PS Oaks. You can see it from there. And app one you can see it from there too. So this should be the solution then. Let's check it. Congratulations, you solved the challenge. Well, that was uh, easy. I am going to copy this command, though. Okay. 
Spot mein Run. Ja. Spot mein Run, ja. Ja, so these are exactly the same. So what I've learned is actually going back to my CKS note that Podman and Docker commands are uh, mutual or exactly the same. At least as far as I've seen up until now. These commands run two containers in the same PID namespace. Can check the running, can check if they are running in the same namespace by running the exec qlist copy that whole thing the sleep command appears twice in each container with a different PID. Also note that there are multiple processes running as roots. Okay, that was the first section, and I actually have three pomo three um, minutes left on my Pomodoro timer. So that is actually a nice uh, point to take a break. I have now finished the, this section of the course. I've generated quite a couple of no notes here. Container isolation, containerized applications. I learned that the Linux kernel also has namespaces for isolation. I actually, uh, I only know namespaces in the Kubernetes context, so that was cool to learn that it's actually on the Linux level as well. And yeah, some some good notes here already. And now I will take a 10 minute break. And I am going to continue with network policies. And that is like network policies, I, I have them in my home lab, I know how they work but to actually do them off the cuff on an uh, exam like that will definitely need a, a lot more practice. So let's see, can I, can I run some sort of nice countdown timer in my terminal? That's something I'll have to do, but I'll just do the POMO start. I'll just do another POMO. And if this reaches 240, I'll be back. Piglet on a break. Piglet will return when POMO reaches 40. Be right back.
Got a couple of minutes left and I realized I had another can of Coke. So that was nice. I hardly ever drink soda, but now I felt like I could use one. Uh, I need to figure out if I'm going to be streaming more, I'll need to have a way of doing this better. And I just remembered that Rob, he has this term down thing, I think. Rob. Maybe it's in his dot .files repo. Term, term down. I think term down was the command that he has. Oh, it's not even his term down. Countdown timer and stopwatch in your terminal. Okay, so that's a pip package. Pip three install term down. Okay, apparently I have a, no wait. Ruinstall install term down. Wow, I don't have any Python pip install term now. I thought I had pa Python packages installed. That's interesting. So it will only run as a pip. Hmm. You didn't find it like that. No available formula with term now. I know it's pip pip three install term down, but it is um, apparently have some sort of Python environment configured for my brew. I was not aware of that. Yeah, prob like I, this is probably not something that I should dive into right now. But is there a countdown? Countdown timer in terminal. If I have a quick solution for that. Uh, and if not, like my, my break is already over, by the way. It's, yeah, no, I'm not going to fix this now. But what I did was actually quite, quite handy that I, that what I had going on here. On a break, will return when Pomo reaches 40 minutes. I could just write a script for that and call it break and then at least I have something to show but like which break is that a command already no let's do new script new script break does that do that here No, it, it did do it in my scripts directory. So I'll just go to V break and I'll just add piglet on a break. Pomo start piglet on a break will return when Pomo reaches 40 minutes. This is a quick solution. 
now and then I'll do it later. So break. Ah, break will okay. Uh, dot C D scripts. Move break to start break. That will work. On a break, will return when power reaches 40 minutes, and then it has a timer up here. So now I have a quick little script. Okay, that works. Uh, um, feed add break script. Okay, that only took a few minutes. I wasn't distracted too long. So now I can continue with my with my uh, CKS studies, Pomo start. Okay, so I just finished the container um, isolation exercises. Those worked pretty well. Uh, I had no problem solving those. So CKS now going and moving on to the next section, which is going to be network policies. Hey, Hervé. Hey, Ben Archer. Nice to see you guys. Starting the new POMO timer and starting the next section, Network Policies. And with this little addition, we now say this container says something by various scenarios. Important fresh network security policies. <clears throat> Very important and interesting topic, in my opinion. What we will do, at first, I'll go into detail what network policies are and how they work. Afterwards, we will define our own default deny policy, following by various scenarios that we're going to implement. After this, you will understand network security policies. What are they? Network policies. Well, they are the firewall rules in Kubernetes. They are implemented by the CNI, by the Container Network Interface which is installed in the cluster, so like Calico or Weave. So if the CNI um, doesn't support network policies, you can still create your Kubernetes resources, but they just don't do anything. They're not enforced. They are created on namespace level. They're only valid in one namespace. We will see this later. And well, yeah, they restrict ingress and egress for a specific group of pods based on certain rules and conditions. Without network policy, so if we have a vanilla Kubernetes cluster, then by default, every pod can access every pod. Pods are not isolated. And this is actually a feature from Kubernetes, right? Like it's one condition um, that every pod in the cluster, doesn't matter on which node it's scheduled, every pod can communicate with every pod um, without network address translation. So let's have a look at what network policies can do just in some graphical overview examples that we're going to run through before we go and uh, look into yaml and write we can pods based on their labels okay in orange here and to these pods based on the pod selector to these pods will our network policy rules applied then let's say we have another uh, group of pods here so we specify another pod selector and now what we specify in our network policy is that for that pod selector in orange, we allow policy type egress, we allow outgoing traffic to these pods. Okay, should be really simple. From a source pods, we allow outgoing traffic to, to another pod selector, to these pods based on labels. Also possible, same scenario, but from or to this pod selector in orange, we allow incoming traffic, so ingress traffic from these pods. Also possible, okay? And if we have a look at this example right now, then this pod one can only receive incoming traffic from pods of this pod selector. Because as soon as you specify one network policy, yet now in this case, for example, network policy of type ingress, then you restrict all other ingress and you only allow that ingress that you kind of whitelisted in your network policies. If there are no network policies, then everything is allowed. 
Another example instead of using the pod selector is also that we use a namespace selector. So in this scenario, for these bunch of pods based on the pod selector, we allow incoming traffic from all pods in a certain namespace. And what's also possible is to use an IP block definition, where we say in this example now, we allow these pods to have outgoing traffic to this IP address range. And we could also specify that this IP address range or that these pods can receive ingress traffic from this IP address range, okay? And this we could do in two separate network policies, then they would be merged. We're gonna look at this uh, in more detail, but we could also create this in one network policy where we have actually rules for the egress and the ingress. In the section before, we had a look at network policies from like a top overview, um, and we saw what they're like capable of in theory. Now we're gonna look at one extensive example of a network policy in YAML, and we dive into detail and explain every section so that you can create afterwards every kind of network policy that you kind of want. This network policy, we see kind network policy, is created in namespace default, and we have a pod selector for pods with the label ID frontend, okay? So that means this network policy will be applied to pods with ID frontend in namespace default. Now we have another um, section here, policy types. Policy types uh, can receive an array of entries ingress or egress, and this, in this case, we only specify egress. This network policy that we see here right now is already a valid policy, okay? We could create that policy right now. What does it do? It denies all outgoing traffic from pods with label ID frontend in namespace default. Okay, it denies all outgoing traffic because we said that this network policy is about outgoing traffic and we didn't specify any rules to allow any traffic, this, which means that this policy right now simply doesn't allow any outgoing traffic. So it prevents, it disallows any outgoing traffic. Now let's allow some traffic. Yeah, so that's that's where I always get it wrong, right? I, I, I have some network policies here. These are um, Cilium network policies, so they are a little bit different than uh, the normal standard network policies that he's talking about. But just the fact that this is already a valid network policy, that is definitely something I am going to note down. So let's see. Going back to my CKS notes here. And I'm debating whether I should have one network policy note or if I'm going to make different sets out of this. But just go for network policies for now start writing some notes but what I'm actually want to do is CKS I'm going to create some network policy um, files here I'm going to create a directory called network policies in my CKS lab and the egress so Policy types egress. Um, this is already a valid. 
valid policy. This will deny all outgoing traffic from pods. The label ID is front end. So that is something that I'll have to, like I fully want to internalize this. This will deny all outgoing traffic from the pod. So I understand that this, like network policies is my, my, my weakness and I'm going to put in a lot of practice into this. So I'm just going to really make sure I understand what is going on here. So what he was saying before, if you have no policies, then everything is allowed. But as soon as you apply some sort of policy, nothing is allowed except for what you define. <laughs> that is actually something I should note down here. So by default, all pods can communicate with each other. That's something I knew. And I also kind of knew that uh, if you have no policies, if you apply one policy, um, only that policy is allowed. Is that what he said? Like, did I get that right? Let's check it out. ...is created in namespace default, and we have a pod select DBC address traffic from this IP in one net. In the section before, what they're like capable network policies from like a top overview in this outgoing traffic to these pods okay should be really simple from a source very important i'll go into detail and our own what are all in the cluster policies you can later and well yeah there it's end if we have a vanilla kubernetes cluster then by default every pod can access every pod pods are not isolated and this is actually a feature from Kubernetes, right? Like it's one condition um, that every pod in the cluster, doesn't matter on which node it's scheduled, every pod can communicate with every pod um, mm -hmm. without network address translation. So let's have a look at what net that we're gonna run through. Kubernetes cluster and network policy rules applied. So on the pod selector to these pods, will our network policy rules applied by another pod selector. And now what we specify in our network policy is that for that pod selector in orange, we allow policy type egress, we allow outgoing traffic to these pods. Okay, yeah. should be really simple. From a source pods, we allow outgoing traffic to, to another pod selector, to these pods based on labels. Also possible, same scenario, we allow and can only restore then this is possible, okay? And if we have a look at this example right now, then this pod one can only receive incoming traffic from pods of this pod selector. Because as soon as you specify one network policy, yet now in this case, for example, network policy of type ingress, then you restrict all other ingress and you only mm -hmm. allow that ingress that you kind of whitelisted in your network policies. If they are yeah, that was what I wanted to get. So if you, if you specify a network policy, then only that is allowed, nothing else. Like, did I get that right? Am I understanding that right? Example network policy, as you specify from pods of this pod selector, because as soon as you specify one network policy, yet now in this case, for example, network policy of type ingress, then you restrict all other ingress and you only allow that ingress that you kind of whitelisted in your network policies. If yeah, yeah. Only if you apply one policy, if you apply a policy rule, only 
only that traffic is allowed. So that's why if I just say policy egress here, if I'm not saying the, the egress can go to somewhere, then there is no egress traffic allowed at all because I'm not saying you can go here. I'm just saying the policy type is egress and I'm not specifying any rules. Ah, that's why it is. So in this case, because no egress rules traffic is allowed, is defined. Yeah. Because no egress rule is defined, no egress traffic is allowed either. So that's why it is. Yeah. I think I fully grasp it now, this particular one. I think I fully grasp why this is a, f a valid policy. I select these pods, I'm just saying egress, and I'm not defining any rules for the egress. Therefore, if I don't specify you can do this, then nothing can be done. Okay. there are no network policies, then everything is allowed. Another example instead of using the pod selector is also that we use pod selector. And what's also possible is to use an IP in your favorite editor. This one and this will be applied to allow incoming traffic. What's so possible is to use an IP block definition where we say in this example now we allow these pods to have outgoing traffic to this and we didn't specify any rules to allow any traffic this which means that this policy right now simply doesn't allow any outgoing traffic so it prevents it disallows any outgoing traffic mm. now let's allow some traffic same network policy as before um, we just extended it here on on the bottom and we will go now again through all the various things okay you know, just to test myself, here I realize, here I see policy type is egress, and by creating the egress block, this is where you actually define the rules. So I'm saying you're allowed to go have outbound traffic, egress traffic to this namespace um, on only through this protocol to those ports. So you can only go to this namespace, this port, and you can only connect to pods that have the label backend. So if there are pods in there that have any other label or no label, it cannot connect to it. We have the pod selector. Let's see if I get that right. On top, as before, ID front end will be applied. This network policy will be applied to these pods. This network policy is about outgoing traffic. Then we have the first outgoing traffic rule, the first egress rule. And this rule can be read as allow outgoing traffic to namespace with label ID NS1 and port 80. Okay. This array entry here, we see one here, we see one here. This means as one rule. So this is the second rule down here, the second egress rule, this in blue it's the first egress rule. So the first egress rule has two entries. The first entry is the two colon, and the second entry is the ports colon. And these two will be connected end. Okay, so we have an egress rule. We allow egress traffic if the namespace towards the traffic goes has the label ID NS1 and the port is AD on TCP. Mm -hmm. Now let's have a look at the second rule in purple down here. We allow egress to pods 
with label ID backend in the same namespace. Why in the same namespace? Because we didn't specify a namespace selector here, then the same namespace will be will be taken um, where the Aha, I was wrong. I was wrong. I thought these would... I didn't see when I was doing this explanation, I didn't see that it was actually two rules. But now I realize that this rule defines you can go outside of the namespace to here or to these pods in the same namespace. The netback policy is applied to okay yeah. we, we have two egress rules here the blue one and the purple one and these two rules will be connected or okay yeah so we allow egress to namespace with label id ns1 and port 80 or to pods with label id backend in the same namespace now yeah. let's have a look what happens if we create that's actually a very useful image. I'm gonna grab that and add that in my notes. In this image, um, they are two separate rules because they are two arrays, or two, yeah, arrays. The first, the second block, the second two applies to the same namespace because no namespace selector is given here. Now let's have a look what happens if we create multiple network policies because it's possible to have multiple network policies for the same pods, for the same pod selector. What happens yeah. then? If a pod has more than one network policy, well, then they will be simply merged. The union of all network policies is applied to that pod and the order doesn't matter. We have a look at it now. That's interesting. multiple network policies the order does not matter policies will be merged if you have multiple network policies targeting the same pods now what that actually means again we have the same network policy that we took apart uh, before already we see uh, we have our two rules our two egress rules down here now this network policy example 2a only contains the first egress rule like here okay and now we create another network policy example 2b which down here only contains the egress rule uh, the second egress rule from down here okay and what you have to understand is that this rule that this network policy example is the same as example to, to example yeah. 2a plus example 2b merged because if we would create only this one and this one only the two on the right then they have the same pod selector for the same pods which means the egress rules, which are array entries, will simply be merged, so appended, and it would um, result in, in this exactly same network policy here on the left. We will now actually create our first network policy. It will be a default deny policy, and that's good common practice to create default deny policies and then more policies to allow certain traffic. And it's also important to know default deny policies for the CKS certification. We will create a very simple scenario with one front end pod, one back end pod, and we check the connectivity between each before our network policy, after our network policy. And then afterwards, we will extend our example further in more hands on sessions.
You should have access to your master node. Your cluster should be running. You can see my master node, my worker nodes are running. We will now create a very simple scenario. We just run four comments, okay? We simply create a front end pod, k run front end image our beloved nginx and the same for back end k run back end image let's see i'm going to um i have rancher desktop running now I'm in my Ranger desktop context. So K run. I'm in the default namespace. Nothing is running there now. Okay, K run front end image is Nginx. And then the other one will be backend, I suppose. Engine X. Now we expose both. We create cluster internal services so that it will be simple for us to check connectivity. So we run K expose pod front end. We want to expose the pod front end on port 80. And we do the very same for the pod backend. And if we have a look at pods and services, we all we do everything in the default namespace. We see we have a backend pod, front end pod, we have a backend service, front end service. Very simple. Now we check the connectivity from front end to back end. So we simply exec into the front end pod and run curl back end. Okay. This works because back end is the back end service, which points to the back end pod, and we have Kubernetes DNS resolution. And we mm -hmm. see connectivity from front end to back end works. Let's try the other way around. K exec into back end pod and curl the front end. And it works as well. Great. Now we will create our network policy. Okay, so create a new file in your favorite editor called default deny.yaml. I actually have no idea if Rancher Desktop has network policies uh, enabled. So that's going to be interesting to to figure out as well because on a cluster without a network policy engine such as um, or engine or what's it called calico or cilium is it an engine i don't know but you need to have that on your cluster if not policies won't work you can create them it will accept them just fine but you need to have calico installed for them to be functional But let's uh, continue. Default deny.yaml. All right. And we head to the Kubernetes documentation and steal examples. Simply search for network policy. And we can simply look for the first example. There's another section for default deny actually also here, but we will simply work with an example and create it into a default deny policy. So. Simply copy the, copy the example code. We will have a pod selector. We will have the policy types. We don't need the whole example. Well, I can just use the other one I had then. Okay, pod selector. copy the example code we will have a pod selector we will have the policy types we don't need the whole example we copy it okay we will actually first thing we will rename the network policy to default deny and the pod selector we now say look it should be for all pods so we simply can leave it empty like this and here we have a default deny network policy for ingress and egress traffic save it and create it save it for like this and here we have a default deny network policy for 
ingress and egress traffic. Okay, policy types egress and ingress. For good measure, I'll put ingress on top like he has. Pod selector empty, target all pods, policy type ingress, egress. So this means that no pods can have any sort of ingoing or outgoing connectivity. That's what it should do. Pods cannot have ingress or egress traffic, so you can't curl them from one another. That's what he's probably going to get at. Save it and create it. Okay, great. Now we can run the first exec comment again from front end to back end. And we see it doesn't look that good anymore. And we run the other exec comment from back end to front end. Okay, so kind network policy running into an API error, so something went wrong. What is the latest API version? Here. There we go. Let's apply that then. So I don't know if Rancher has uh, a network policy, if it has Calico installed or not, but we're going to find out. So now I should not be able to do the curl yeah okay so it branch your desktop does have a way of enabling network policies because i'm not able to curl anymore so move this to one so just again to show okay delete pod misha I have two pods, front end and back end. And if I do a curl from front end to Is it really curl back end? And we see. Yeah, it's just that curl backend. So if I delete, K okay, delete network policies, default deny. And if I do the curl again, now it does work. So I curl from the front end pod to back end. It works. If I now apply my default deny.yaml and do the same curl. It won't work, could not resolve host backend. Okay, so we know that Rancher Desktop is enables network policies, and I fully understand my default deny policy here. Like I I I re I understand this. I select all the pods, and these I know because because I'm saying ingress egress, but I'm not having any two rules down here. It means that you won't deny, you won't allow any traffic. It doesn't work anymore. Okay, network policies work. Our default deny policy works great, and we set up this example. And in the next hands-on sessions, we will then specifically allow certain traffic. We will continue with our example. And we will now allow front end pods to connect to back end pods. This means we will create one network policy to allow outgoing traffic from front end and one network policy to, to allow incoming traffic from front end to back end. And we do it based on pod selectors. If you like, feel free to go ahead, pause the video, try it yourself. Otherwise, follow me along and see how I will try to implement it. Okay. On my master node, we still have the default deny network policy 
it's still applied in the cluster. We will now create a second policy called frontend.yaml or the, the file called frontend.yaml and I'll head to the Kubernetes documentation and I will steal that whole example that we see here and I'll adjust it to our needs. Okay, here we are. Let's start from the very top. I will change the name to frontend. The pod selector, um, so the network policy will be applied to pods with label run frontend. Because we created the pods with kubectl run, they all automatically get the labels run. That policy, let's have a look, that policy will be from frontend to backend. So from frontend we will allow egress, outgoing traffic to backend. Which means I will delete the egress here and um, we need the pod selector. So what I will actually do, I will delete the egress section here. I will change this to egress. We will allow, so we allow egress. We will now create our first egress rule too. And then we have already the pod selector here that we can steal. Great. So we'll allow egress to run backend. Okay. It's called front end. It so we'll allow egress. Okay. That's pretty straightforward. Two. And then pod selector. run backend to run backend okay it's called front end it will be applied to pods with run front end and will allow outgoing traffic to pods with backend all right mm -hmm. let's create the front end network policy Ingress, okay, it's called egress. There we go. We still have our exec comments here. So what I try now, k exec, I connect from front end curl back end, okay? And we see it doesn't work. Why doesn't it work? Well, we can't think right now that it doesn't work because the back end pods still don't low incoming traffic. Mm. Um, from frontend pods because our default deny policy still applies. Yep. What we can do now is we will create another policy backend and for this we can simply copy frontend to backend because they will be very similar. And in the backend policy I will change the name. I'll change it to backend. This policy will now be applied to backend pods. For the backend pods, we allow incoming traffic, so ingress, and we will create one ingress rule from coming from pods with the label frontend. Okay. Let's have a look if we can create this one without any. Let's frontend. So we define ingress rule where we say from front end. Like I, I understand this. We are we are saying all of the backend pods will get an ingress rule which states that traffic from front end pods are allowed. Okay. Let's have a look if we can create this one without any issues. Yes. Let's have a look if we can now connect from front end to back end. And we see it still doesn't work. Okay. The thing now is that if we want our front end pod to connect to the back end service, then we need DNS resolution, cluster internal DNS resolution. But our default deny policy right now even ah. denies DNS traffic on port 53. Yeah. So what we can do now is actually, we have a look at all pods and their IP addresses and we connect via IP address. 
Okay. Here we can see we have our backend pod. It has the label run backend. Frontend pod has the label run frontend. Okay. Now what we do is we exec into frontend pod and we do a curl not on the name but towards the IP address of the backend pod. And we see it works. Just a short update. If you actually would like to allow DNS resolution, for example, between frontend and backend pods, you could extend your default denied policy where you would allow some yeah. egress to the ports 53 TCP and pods like towards the. Okay, well, let's just try that first. KGP. So. He takes the IP of the backend pod, which is this. So now if you curl this, now it will work. Yeah. And then to IP allow DNS, the we'll have to... And receive it works. Just a short update. If you actually would like to allow DNS resolution, for example, between frontend and backend pods, you could extend your default denied policy where you would allow some egress to the ports 53 TCP and 53 UDP. The link to an example of this is also in the resources section of this video. Okay. And we also can try the other way around. We will try to connect to the front end pod to the IP. Let's try that. Now I've added this to my default deny. It's configured, so now I should be able to do curl the back end like this. Yep, using the DNS name. All right. That works. And now, can I go from backend to frontend? No, it won't work because I haven't allowed any egress rules uh, uh, of the or, front end or ingress rules for from that. From the backend part, and it doesn't work, right? Because we only allowed one way. We only allowed outgoing traffic from frontend and incoming traffic into back end from front end. If you didn't manage to get it to run yourself, maybe I was a bit too fast at some places, you can also head to the course repository. It's linked in the video resources. Okay, so I'm in course content cluster setup, network policies, and in network policies, I'm in the front end back end example. We can have a look. There's also the default deny example that we used before, and then the network policies, front end back end. Um, there you have the front end, uh, you can just copy it and it'll work. And there's also the back end, you can copy and it will work. Okay. We will extend now our example a final time. And we still have our front end pod, our back end pod, the communication works. And now we will actually create another pod, Cassandra, and we will allow back end to talk to Cassandra, to our database pods. Hmm. And we will do this by also creating a new namespace. So the Cassandra pod will be running in a new namespace, Cassandra, and we will allow backend pods to have egress traffic to the namespace Cassandra. Okay, for this, let's create um, the new namespace, create namespace Cassandra. Okay, and we can simply edit the namespace and apply some labels, labels to it. Okay, we have metadata, labels, and we will apply the label namespace Cassandra to it. Because when we work with network policies and namespace selectors, it always works with labels. So our namespaces in this case have to have labels. Okay, that's done. Then let's create a Cassandra pod. In namespace Cassandra, we run Cassandra, image, engine X, just for testing here. Okay, great. Let's have a look at that pod and the IP address of that pod. 
so we do get pod dash or white there we go and now we try to exec from our backend pod and we will try to exec to that to curl that ip and we see it's not allowed why because we didn't specifically allow it yet mm -hmm. okay if we have a look in our backend policy then right now we then right now we actually don't allow any egress traffic we only allow certain ingress traffic but the default deny policy is still in place and the default deny policy still allows any outgoing traffic from any pod so what we have to do here now is to specifically allow outgoing traffic to the namespace cassandra and we can okay i'm gonna try to do that myself is he gonna do that here to do this by saying that this policy yeah so before he does this i'm gonna try myself so i'm gonna say egress here then i'm gonna add an egress block saying two and then it was the Where did I have that namespace? Um, there was this namespace selector. I thought we had an example with namespace selector already. Apparently I don't. Um, so, is it this then? Namespace selector. Two. Namespace selector. Match labels. NS Cassandra. Because that's what he just showed. Here we go. That's what he just showed. So I'm saying front end pods, no, all back end pods can get incoming traffic from front end pods and they may go out to pods in the Cassandra namespace. So if I apply this, Now, if I do the curl again, now it works. I'm curling the Cassandra pod in, in the Cassandra namespace. And it works because I've added the egress traffic. So I, I solved that by myself. That's, that's nice. Will now also contain outgoing traffic rules. And I copy the selector um, Cassandra. So we allow two namespaces which have the namespace label NS. Have the name Let's yeah, that's exactly this. what I did. Let's apply our changes. Seems to be configured. And let's try to run our curl command again. And there we go. It works. Mm. Okay. So now we actually allowed the backend to connect to Cassandra. We can go now even further and also implement a default deny policy in the namespace Cassandra because we know that's good practice, right? So what we do is we copy our default deny to default deny Cassandra. Or, I, or not default deny, default is the namespace, so we call it Cassandra deny. 
and what I change is the name. I call it here Cassandra Deny and in the namespace Cassandra. Okay, we create the one. And we try to connect from our backend port to Cassandra again, and we see it doesn't work. We now have to explicitly. Okay, that's interesting. So, Cassandra deny. I made a typo there. Cassandra. I'm almost coming up to my break, but I just want to test if. Yeah, so if I apply this now, apply F Cassandra default deny, now my curl should not work anymore. Nope, it doesn't work. Okay, so I did that correctly. But my break is now uh, done, or it is now break time. This is my second POMO. I definitely have another POMO in me, so I'm gonna take a break and I'm gonna continue after that. So, let me see if I move this. Now I have my snazzy little script that should, if I work, if I do start break. Here we go. On a break, we'll return when POMO reaches 40 minutes. I'll um, answer some chat questions when I get back from my break, and now I'll just uh, take ten minutes. See you. See you later.
right, back at it. Was a little bit longer than uh, expected, but I had some delicious avocado tomato toast. I needed to have some food to keep the brain fueled. Start a new Pomo timer and take a couple of questions. Um, what resource are you studying from? Uh, if you just search on YouTube CKS course, there there is like a, an 11 hour course. Yeah, 11 hour course that was uh, published two months ago. It was a, actually a paid Udemy course, but the guy uh, decided to publish it for free. He's actually the creator of Killer SH and Killer Coda, so I th I think he he is he's just uh, financially independent at this point, to say the least. All of those people taking the CKA exams are really cool. What he has built and uh, what he has done really inspiring. So. I'm going to do it one more POMO, 50 minutes of network policies, and then um, it will be three hours of studying this fine Sunday. So without further ado, I'm going to continue. <clears throat> Allow ingress coming from backend pods into Cassandra. Okay. For this, what I do now is I simply copy the backend.yaml and I call it Cassandra.yaml. And I edit it. Okay. I change the name to Cassandra. That network policy will be running in the namespace Cassandra. It will be applied to pods with the label run Cassandra. We will only allow incoming traffic ingress. And we will allow incoming traffic. Um, let's also do it by a namespace selector. So we allow incoming traffic from namespace, namespace default. Okay. So Cassandra, Cassandra namespace. What's Cassandra? We allow incoming traffic ingress from the namespace with the label namespace and as default. Okay, pod selector, match labels, run Cassandra. Ingress only from Namespace selector. Yeah, so all pods which have the label Let's run Cassandra. Are allowed to receive traffic traffic from the default namespace. That's what we're saying here. Let's create it. Let's run our Excel command again. And yeah, it didn't work yet. Why? Well, our default namespace doesn't have the label yet. So. I'll edit the default namespace and Okay. So testing a curl. No, that doesn't work. And now still doesn't work. And I add the label NS default. Ah, it doesn't work because I didn't apply the policy. And now it works. Okay. So what we did in the whole scenario is we allowed one way of connection from front end to back end. 
based on labels and then from back end to Cassandra. Okay, so I apply it now. And if I now do the curl, it works. Yeah. Based on namespace labels. So the first one on pod labels, the second one on namespace labels. I think that's very a good base right now for network policies. And but if you like, you like to extend the scenario a little bit more, you could restrict it a bit more. Right now, the back end um, can connect to Cassandra just based on the namespace label. You could also restrict it on pods, right? You could add an additional pod restriction that the connections from back end to Cassandra will only be allowed on port 80 where the Nginx is running by default in our scenario. And also for this example that we just did, you can also find the solution in our GitHub repository example. Okay, let's try that then. And also extend this to restrict backend Cassandra based on additional pod label and additional port. So. The Cassandra pods are now currently allowing all traffic from the namespace, but we also just want to say um, where was the one that we had with ports? Did we have anything with ports? No. We can just do it like this. So we are going to say ports ah. so it's like this, it's not an array we say ports we are only going to allow port 80 and protocol well, did he say anything about protocol? No, right? Well, we'll just try port 80, protocol TCP. So now we're only allowing port. No, I'm getting this wrong. I'm saying I'll only allow ingress traffic that's coming from port A. So is that what he so means? Only be allowed on port. Also restricted on pods, right? You could add an additional pod restriction that the connections from back end to Cassandra will only be allowed on port 80, where the Nginx is running by default in our scenario. on the namespace label, you could also restrict that on pods, right? You could add an additional pod restriction that the connections from backend to Cassandra. Connections from backend to Cassandra. So we're gonna add a pod selector as well. From backend to Cassandra. Will only be allowed on port 80, where the will only be allowed the Nginx is running by default in our scenario on port 80 but here I'm saying it's only from ports 80 so I'm wondering I'm probably not getting this right but anyway let's let's try to add the pod selector Run backend. So we're only allowing pods from from the default namespace with the backend label to port eighty. And also for this example that we just did. You can also find the solution in our GitHub repository, network policies, example, front and back end database. There you have all files 
and you can just use them, apply them and play around with them. And the link to it is also um, available in the resources section of this video. Okay, let's try that then. I don't think I did it correctly, but hey. I'm gonna apply Cassandra.yaml. Okay, so it still works. So what is the solution that he proposed then? Course content. Mm. What was the path? Cassandra. Cassandra. An additional cloud example that we just policies, example, front and back and dead. Cluster setup network policies. database there you have all files and you can just use them apply them and play around with them and the link to it is also um, available in the resources section of this video okay and to close the section network policies i really recommend reading in this case through the documentation so the link is in the resources but also simply go to the documentation network policies and read through it it should make things should make more sense let's have, have a look at the examples listed there as well and yeah well we talked about network policies i hope you understand it now way better than before we talked about egress and ingress rules you can have them in one network policy or in different ones then they will be merged you can have default deny policies there's also a section in the kubernetes documentation about it should you need it in the cks certification exam we whitelist allow then based on the default denies we create other policies which whitelist allow some egress some ingress rules and yeah we did it on various selectors like pod selectors and namespace selectors okay let's solve some scenarios see if i have actually grasped the material Hmm. We'll see. Network policy. Namespace selector. There are only three. Okay, only three scenarios apparently. That policy create default deny. Start. There are existing pods in namespace app. We need a new default deny network policy named deny out for all outgoing traffic from namespace app. It should still allow DNS traffic on port 53, TCP and UDP. Okay, so there is the namespace app. There are two pods there. We need a new default deny network policy named deny out all outgoing traffic from namespace app. No create command for network policy. So then I'll have to train myself to quickly find that on the docs. But that's okay. Let me just 
try it like this. Vim deny out for YAML. So name is going to be deny out in the namespace app. For all outgoing traffic from namespace app. So the pod selector is then this because we are going to select all of the pods outgoing traffic so it's going to be ingress no egress egress no ingress And then, so then it's just ports, TCP port 53, and UDP. We need a new default deny network policy named deny out for all outgoing traffic from namespace. I think this is it. Let's compare it with the default deny that we have here. Default deny.yaml. Yeah. That's exactly what I what I have here. So I think this is it. Okay, apply f deny out.yaml is created let's check it yes I solved it all right let's go back and check out the solution pod selector yeah it's exactly what I did okay nice be fun to keep as well so I mean network policies in my repo um, make their course content move all to course content make a new directory called Miscellaneous deny out that YAML. Just saving this one for future reference. Okay, so that's the first challenge solved. Back to the CKS scenarios and the network policies. Metadata protection. Let's check out that one. And this is, I plan to do these exercises every single day until I can do it blind and until the exam, basically. Because network policies are, besides RBAC, are my weakest point. And I just want to be able to do it blindly without thinking every day, just do a bunch of these exercises. Because now I'm on the CKS one, but... The CKA and the CKAD, all of them have network policy uh, practices as well. So, on to the next challenge. Create a new network policy to restrict access to IP. Cloud providers can have metadata servers which expose critical information. For example, GCP or AWS. 
assume that there is a metadata server 111. You can test that with this. Okay. Create a network policy named metadata server in namespace default, which restricts all egress traffic to that IP. Should only affect pods with label trust is nope. Okay, so then we're going to copy our example again and just to test how do I reach it, I go to Kubernetes IO exam test. I'm going to search for network policy. Here I am. And here is the policy. And one other good thing to test is some, I've heard horror stories where the search was not working on the website. So it's also good to learn how to navigate the website properly. So concepts. And then that should be networking. Nope, I was wrong. Oh, your network policies. Network. Here we go. And here we go. Here is our network policy. Try not to rely on search too much. Vim. Paul.yaml. Create a network policy named metadata server. Metadata server in the namespace default. It's going to be an egress type. Restricts all egress traffic to that IP. Okay, so it should allow it should allow all egress except for that IP. So is it this block then? So is it then zero 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 zero? And then accept one point one point one. Is that it? Should only affect pods with label trust is nope. Okay, so the pod selector is trust is nope. There's not going to be any ingress rules. No ports are mentioned, I think. Metadata server, namespace default, which restricts all egress traffic to that IP, to 111. So here I'm saying you may do all egress with this cider except for this IP. I think this is it. Let's check out the tips. There are existing pods with labels we can use for testing. Okay. Yeah, so this is 
I see. This is a hint. I think. Okay, so my pole at Yamo is not completely right. It has to be in this. format okay it's not a valid cider of course this needs to be a slash 32 it is created So it should restrict all egress traffic to the IP. So no trust, this pod should not be able to access it and that one should. So if I do If I do k exec trust zero curl one point one point one. Okay, that I can do. But if I do it from the no trust. It won't work. And if I delete network policies, networking metadata server, if I delete the network policy and then do the exec from no trust, it works. Yep, I solved it. I solved it. So if I, th this should be it. Okay, apply F poll.yaml and yeah let's just check it cool I solved the challenge all right maybe I'm better at this than I thought I, I thought I didn't understand network policies that well but I am able to solve these exam questions I just need to get quick at them but I was able to just discern, like I've never done this from, I've never used those uh, IP blocks and then an exception to them, but I was able to figure it out. So getting more confident. Uh, Paul, I'm gonna save this one because it's nice to have a bit of a reference. Vim um, IP block accept at YAML. Oops. That's a nice little example. Actually, I'm going to rename misc to killer Coda. Because these are just killer coda solutions. And I'm committing all of this to my lab repo. This is Misha Vandenberg slash lab. And then it's in my Kubernetes CKS network policies, killer coda, if you want to see what I'm committing. So doing pretty good so far. I've solved all of these challenges without any 
real struggle. So let's go to the next one. Hey, is this not marked as solved? I literally, literally just solved that one. Well, let's do it one more time. Like I literally have it. I thought I even had it on my clipboard, but that's just. Paste that in. worked check validation successful okay going back to the scenarios here now it's marked as done yeah i was getting a little bit <laughs> autistic on the check mark i needed to have the check mark there so i know that i can do it next network network policy namespace selector allow communication between two namespaces Cool. Let's try it out. There are existing pods in namespace space one and space two. We need a new network policy named NP that restricts all pods in namespace one to have outgoing traffic to pods in space two. Incoming traffic is not affected. We also need a new that restricts all pods in space 2 to only have incoming traffic. Okay. Sure. The network policies should still allow outgoing traffic. Okay, let's break it down and just do it one by one. Start with this one. Incoming traffic not affected. So that's going to be an egress network policy. So I'm going to call this one np.yaml. Again, I'm going to go to the Kubernetes documentation concepts, networking, network policies, copy this. Use that as an example. Incoming traffic not affected, so delete anything that has to do with ingress. Keeping it around for an example. The egress that restricts all pods in namespace one to only have outgoing traffic to pods in namespace 2. So the name is NP. It lives in namespace space 1. And then the pod selector is going to be this, because we're going to select all the pods in namespace 1. To only have outgoing traffic to pods in space 2. So then it should be space two. Let's check out the K get and S space. Okay, edit NS space 2. Does it have any labels? Let's add a label NS space 2. OK, 
Okay. Only have outgoing traffic to pods in namespace two. I think that should be it. And it's saying we also need a new, uh, the network policy sh should still allow outgoing DNS traffic. Yeah, so there's also then ports. Protocol TCP port FTP and UDP. No. This is an, a separate rule. Because if I don't have it as a separate rule, I think this should be it. Because if I don't have it as a separate rule, I'm saying you can only go to port 53 in this entire namespace. So it should be like this then. Let's check out this default. I think that's it. In space one, select all the pods. Then we're saying you may go to namespace two and you can may go to anything that has port TCP in port 53. Okay. Next. We are going to call this one. We also need a new network policy named NP. So they're going to have the same name. Oh, so I should just use the same one then. That restricts all pods in namespace to only have incoming traffic from pods in space one. Outgoing not affected. Oh, they can have the same name, but in different namespaces, sure. So let's just test if this one will work. It doesn't spec ports. Okay, so now it works. We need a new network policy named NP. So I'm going to copy this one to mp2.yaml. Has the same name, but this one lives in space two. To only have incoming traffic. So this is going to be an ingress policy ingress from from pods in namespace space one okay so then it will be uh k edit ns space one Label is NS space one. Uh, 
outgoing traffic not affected. The network policy should still allow outgoing DNS traffic. So if it says outgoing traffic not affected, I will still need an egress block, right? Because now I'm saying only ingress traffic is allowed. So I, I, I will need an egress block. Egress. And then And then egress. Oops. Like this. I think that's it. Okay. That worked. Let's check out tip. For learning, you can check out the network policy editor. Yeah. Yeah. So I've done that correctly. Okay. Shall we just do, run the check and see if I did it? Yeah, I'll just check it. <laughs> wow, what? I just did that? I solved it without... Damn. I did not expect myself to just solve that without even looking at the documentation or anything. I. Turns out I do understand network policies, apparently. I just did that without any looking anything up. Just talking myself through it. Cool. Solution part one. Yeah, that's exactly what I did. Ah, well, he uses this one. I just added a name. So let's check out the egress one. Impedodiamo, this one. Egress to. Ah, so I did do it differently. He has one rule, so it's only to this space. And you may only go to these ports in that namespace. And what I did is I'm saying you may go to that namespace and you can go out anywhere to port 53. Okay. The next part. Here I did... The same, space two. Yeah. Okay, so I took that a little bit too literally. Like I add this egress apparently is not necessary or it's not checking that. Okay, but hey. It worked. I solved it. Pretty cool. I'm not going to save these or, well, like the only difference I did was this. So I, I just delete this one and this one. Then I basically have the same one. So I'll just save it. Um, 
b space 2 but yaml like this space 2 and this is Space one dot yaml. Pretty cool. Four minutes left on my Pomodoro, and I've worked through the network policies module completely, and I solved all of the challenges. Challenges. Nice. Are there any more network policies here? No, not on this one. But for the CKS, I've solved all of the network policies here. What is the next section? That is going to be cluster setup GUI elements. Okay. I finished the solving the killer coda. Control access to GUI elements. Control access to GUI elements. Okay. Well, that's going to be the next round of study. It's been three hours of study this Sunday. Now I think I will do some shopping and prepare some food for the week. But I do have three minutes left on my Pomodoro timer. So let's quickly see if there are some more network policies for me to solve. There's another one here for the CKAD. Is that the same one? Network policy namespace selector. Yeah. Oh no, no, these are, it, it is a different one. Okay. There are existing pods in namespace one and two, we need a new network policy named MP that restricts all pods in space one to only have outgoing traffic to pods in namespace two. Incoming is not affected. Okay. P.yaml. Can I do this within, what is it, three minutes that I have? Two, two minutes, two and a half minutes left. Can I do this? The namespace should be and the name should be NP. Restricts all pods in namespace one. The pod selector is this because it's all pods in space one. To only have outgoing traffic, so no ingress. pods in namespace 2. So it is an egress block with a namespace selector. What are the labels? Okay, so have the pods in namespace space two. So I'm going to copy this label. Okay, 
Should be this then. Name NP. Restricts all pods in space one. Yeah. Egress. Two pod selector. Oh no, wait, this is wrong. Egress two. Namespace selector. Label namespace two. Yeah. This should be it then. Create it. Let's check it. Oh, it failed. Okay. What am I doing wrong? Name NP. All pods in space one. Only have outgoing traffic to pods. Oh, it is a separate two. So here it is a separate two rule then. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> hey. Okay, yeah, because I was, what I was saying was exactly what, maybe there's a mistake in the other one then. But as what I was saying in the other one, like I was only allowing to this space two and these ports, but it should be a separate rule. So that works. You can use this template, sure. Well, that's easy then. Then you just need to add the namespace selector. Huh? Oh, is that it? It's just plain wrong YAML. Wait, what? This is the solution? I fixed it, so I'm happy just to try it out. Ports. I mean, this is exactly what I'm doing here. No, wait. Here. That's it. Yeah. So now check this one. Yeah. All right. Well, that's the last network policy. Three minutes over time, but hey, at least I uh, solved it. So, okay, I seem to be able to fix these, these solutions. So that's interesting. I thought I was, I would do a lot worse then is that I would have to look up more information, but apparently I'm doing doing okay. I'm happy with this. Let's see, a couple of questions in the chat. How to handle pressure in Scrum sprints as a Java developer? Ooh, how to handle pressure? Um, well, you, you have to think about is it unreasonable pressure or is it is it like is it because of you or is or is the scrum master too uh, too on your on your neck i don't like it when people are on my neck that actually has a uh, adverse effect but i don't i don't work as a developer so i'm i'm sorry i can't really answer that 
The only thing you can do is just be very clear on your feelings and communicate them well. And uh, I think that's one way of handling the pressure to communicate that you feel too much pressure and maybe talk to your teammates about it. Kubernetes are just server clusters, right? Yeah, in a way, yeah. It's just uh, virtual machines talking intelligently to each other. Okay, it was a three-hour Sunday study session. I'm happy with the progress I made today. The first actual study session for my CKS exam. I have about uh, nine hours left in the course, but at least I'm happy I'm, I can get going with practicing network policies uh, every day now. So thank you so much for tuning in and uh, hope to see you in the next session. Have a good day, guys.